Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today's comparison is one that I've been promising for quite some time now, and with Computex 2019 out of the way, I thought it was time I finally made it happen. I am, of course, talking about an updated comparison between the Ryzen 5 1600 and the Core i5-7600K. So it's time to see which processor offers gamers the best performance in 2019. Before that though, today's video is sponsored by Corsair and their Void Pro RGB and HS70 wireless gaming headsets. Both offer an exceptional audio experience using specially tuned 50mm neodymium speaker drivers and the premium build quality means they're not just highly durable, but also very comfortable. Both offer a 16 hour runtime with a slew of other features. So for more information, please check them out via the link in the video description. Now, back in 2017, when the R5 1600 was first released, you could quite easily argue in favor of the 7600K as it was the better gaming CPU at the time. It was faster in the vast majority of games and in games that were considered to be quite old at the time, but still rather popular, the 7600K was much faster. However, for newly released titles, so that is newly released titles in 2017, they were for the most part quite evenly matched. And we saw in some of the more heavy, uh, core heavy games, such as Ashes of the Singularity, the Ryzen CPU was a little bit faster. But performance in titles such as Battlefield 1, for example, were also more consistent. That said, we still saw the Ryzen processors struggle in a number of titles, such as Armor 3, Deus Ex Mankind Divided, Far Cry Primal, Grand Theft Auto 5, Total War, Warhammer 2, and Watch Dogs 2, for example. Despite that, though, I preferred the Ryzen 5 1600 overall as it was cheaper and I believed represented better value. It featured superior platform support, came with a box cooler, and generally beat the Core i5 processor in productivity workloads. In fact, for intensive workloads, the Ryzen 5 1600 mimicked what we saw from the Core i7-7700K, and that was hugely impressive for the time. For those reasons and more, just two months after its release, we named the Ryzen 5 1600 as the best value desktop CPU. That said, I noted that for high refresh rate gaming, the 7600K would be the better choice, at least in the short term, but I did expect the extra two cores and eight threads of the Ryzen 5 processor to come in handy before too long. Well, it's now roughly two years later and we haven't really revisited this comparison. Rather, the focus over the last year or so has been on the Zen Plus processors, such as the Ryzen 5 2600. Today though, all that changes, but before we get into the results, here's a quick look at the test system specs. The Ryzen 5 1600 was tested on the MSI B450 Tomahawk using G-Skills Ripjaws V-Series DDR4-3200CL15 memory. Then the Core i5-7600K was tested on the ASRock Z270 Taichi with the same G-Skill Ripjaws 5 memory. Both systems were also configured using the Extreme Memory Profile while MCE was disabled on the Intel system, at least for the stock testing. Both also used the Gigabyte RTX 2080 Ti Aorus Extreme, and the CPUs were cooled using the Corsair Hydro Series H100i Pro RGB all-in-one liquid cooler. Both CPUs were tested stock and then with a realistic overclock applied, so we're not pretending every CPU sold is of the highest quality silicon. In total, there are eight games tested at two resolutions, so over 200 benchmark runs were made to create this content. Certainly not our biggest benchmark session ever, but a decent effort overall, I think. Anyway, enough chit chat, let's get into the results. First up, we have the newest title that we're now benchmarking with, Rage 2, and this game uses the Vulkan API exclusively, and to be honest, it's not the most demanding CPU title out there, as we found it plays pretty well on a modest quad core. As you can see here, the Core i5-7600K offered a slight performance bump over the Ryzen 5 1600, though given the clock speed deficit, you'd probably expect the margins to be a little greater than they are at 1080p with an RTX 2080 Ti. Then moving to 1440p, we see similar margins. The Core i5 processor is a little faster out of the box, but once we overclock both processors, that margin is reduced to almost nothing. World War Z supports DirectX 11 and Vulkan, but for best performance we always test with the Vulkan API. Here we see that although both CPUs allowed for well over 100 FPS out of the box, the 7600K was 14% faster on average. Again, this is another title that isn't particularly taxing on the CPU, and we found that modern quad cores will get the job done. As we move to 1440p, we see that the margins are virtually eliminated. Here the 7600K was just 4% faster out of the box and 3% once both CPUs were overclocked. If you recall, back when we first benchmarked gaming performance for the Ryzen 1000 series, we found that Far Cry Primal was 
a particularly bad title for AMD's new Ryzen CPUs. It seems single thread performance is the key here. That and these Far Cry games just aren't developed with Ryzen in mind, despite AMD sponsoring the latest installment in the series, though I believe that was mostly to optimize for their Radeon technology. Anyway, whatever the case, the Ryzen CPUs don't do well in Far Cry games, and we have another good example of that here with Far Cry New Dawn. Although the R5 1600 was able to deliver smooth gameplay, it was still much slower than the Core i5 7600K, which delivered a whopping 25% more frames. The margins are very similar at 1440p as well. Here the R5 1600 isn't able to come back and we saw way better performance out of the Core i5 processor. I should just note that I'm aware that some media have reported frame stuttering, even with the latest six core Core i5 processors in Far Cry 5 and Far Cry New Dawn, but I have to say the experience was certainly no worse than what we saw from the Ryzen 5 1600. The Hitman 2 results for the 7600K are a bit strange. Given how CPU limited this title is, you'd expect a 23% all-core frequency boost for the Core i5 processor to have a rather significant impact on performance, but here it really doesn't. We only saw a few extra frames from the 7600K once overclocked. I should note that we do often see strange results when testing with Hitman 2, and I honestly don't know what's going on here with our NPC heavy benchmark. The R5 1600, on the other hand, saw a decent 6% performance boost from its 8% all-core overclock, so yeah, that makes sense. And we see similar margins at 1440p. Overall, both CPUs delivered a similar gaming experience in Hitman 2. Okay, so things are getting a little bit interesting here. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is one of the most demanding games that's been released in the last year. The Ryzen 5 1600 was noticeably smoother in this title, and with 22% more frames on average, it was a lot faster. And interestingly, again, we see that once overclocked, the 7600K appears so heavily choked that the frequency increase doesn't really help. There appears to be some other kind of bottleneck here. The performance gains for the R5 1600 when overclocked are very mild, but also much more in line with the frequency increase. And then once we move to 1440p, the R5 1600 continues to blitz the 7600K, offering almost 30% more performance when both CPUs are overclocked. The Ryzen 5 1600 also proves to be the superior choice when testing with Assassin's Creed Odyssey. This is another modern demanding title. Here the Ryzen 5 processor offered 16% more performance out of the box, and once the CPUs are overclocked it was still 13% faster. Then we see at the more GPU limited 1440p resolution that the results come together. But even so, once overclocked the R5 1600 still enabled 8% more performance and overall was slightly smoother. Okay, so this is the first time we've really seen the Core i5-7600K fall completely flat on its face. And while Battlefield 5 was still playable, the experience was pretty horrible compared to the smooth R5-1600. We saw a similar thing in our Day 1 Ryzen coverage, though not to the, quite this extent. Back then, the 7600K provided higher frame rates on average in Battlefield 1, but the 1% low performance was noticeably weaker. Today, when testing with Battlefield 5, the 1% low performance is a bit of a disaster for the 7600K, and this means although the R5-1600 was only slightly faster on average, the actual gaming experience was really worlds better. And we see that the Core i5-7600K still crash and burned at 1440p. This really is a game that requires more than four cores and four threads, even if they are clocked at around 5 GHz. Another series of horrible results for the Core i5-7600K can be seen when testing with The Division 2. Here the Ryzen 5 CPU was 33% faster out of the box when comparing the average frame rate and 32% faster for the 1% low result. That margin is reduced once both CPUs are overclocked, but even so the R5-1600 was still 25% faster on average and 24% faster for the 1% low. Then we see at 1440p the R5-1600 still remains well ahead, even with both CPUs overclocked. It really is the clear winner here. That concludes the testing, but for those of you who either weren't paying attention or you've just skipped to this point in the video, I will quickly summarize what we found. Overall, the Ryzen 5 1600 was really only noticeably slower in a single game, and that game was Far Cry New Dawn. Performance was still very smooth though, and the game was very playable, but the frame rates were quite a bit down on what we saw with the Core i5-7600K. The Ryzen processor was also slightly slower in World War Z, while performance was much the same in Rage 2 and Hitman. Then as we moved into the more demanding modern titles, we found the R5-1600 to be a good bit faster in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and then worlds faster when testing with Battlefield 5, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and The Division 2.
So these findings really are in line with what I said and found roughly two years ago now. Back then the Core i5-7600K was faster in the majority of games, as I mentioned earlier in the video, and there were a number of older titles where the Ryzen CPUs did struggle. However, even back then Ryzen still showed a lot of promise. It performed really well in the most demanding titles of the time, and overall we found it was more consistent. Back then, I did recommend the Ryzen 5 1600 over the Core i5-7600K for a number of reasons. I felt many were relevant at the time, but one future reason was that I believed it would eventually end up being the better gaming CPU, and this has certainly ended up being the case, as demonstrated in titles such as Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Battlefield 5, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and The Division 2. It just seemed to me that the Ryzen 5 1600 just had so many more CPU resources that eventually those would come into play, and it would probably happen sooner rather than later. So it is a bit different to the situation we see between processors such as the Ryzen 7 2700X and Core i7-8700K, for example. That said, I should just note that if you're still playing older titles, such as Far Cry Primal, Grand Theft Auto V, and, I don't know, Total War Warhammer 2, for example, then the Core i5-7600K will deliver superior performance in those games, though the Ryzen 5 6100 will still comfortably provide playable performance. Taking all this into consideration, if you were faced with upgrading or building a new PC in mid-2017 and you had the choice between the Core i5-7600K and Ryzen 5 1600 and you needed this new PC to last a few years between upgrades and you intended on playing the latest and greatest games, well, if you went with the 7600K, I have to say you made a mistake. Today the R5-1600 is the superior performer, enabling highly playable performance in all the latest games, while the 7600K struggles in a number of titles and often provides disappointing results. Then as a bonus, if you did invest in the AM4 platform two years ago, you now have the luxury of upgrading to what is expected to be a much more powerful Zen 2 processor without having to change your motherboard. Meanwhile, 7600K owners have to pay through the nose for a 7700K, as that's really their only feasible upgrade option, or at least if they want to stay on the platform. It's probably not a feasible upgrade option, because you'd be better off just buying a B350 motherboard and a Zen 2 processor, or a BFIL50 board, or whatever. But anyway, if you want to enable playable performance on your existing system, then a 7700K will be required to run titles such as Battlefield 5 smoothly. In fact, there's almost no chance you'll land a secondhand 7700K for less than what a brand new Ryzen 5 3600X is going to cost. As a side note, for this video, I've obviously only focused on gaming performance, but if you care at all about core heavy application performance, then there really isn't too much more to discuss here. The Ryzen 5 1600 absolutely thrashed the 7600K at launch, so nothing will have changed here. If anything, Ryzen's actually improved in this area as software continues to be optimized for the Zen architecture. And not only that, but the platform itself has matured quite a lot, and as a consequence, it is now faster and more stable. Meanwhile, the KB Lake range, along with all Intel processors, have become slower due to the security vulnerabilities that were publicly revealed in early 2018. Anyway, it's been great to see how AMD's Ryzen CPUs have totally transformed the desktop PC landscape in such a short period of time. I expect the Ryzen 5 1600 to continue running away with it as we get newer and more demanding games, and I suspect it won't be too much longer before it's constantly nipping at the heels of the Core i7 7700K. And that is going to do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit the like button. Much appreciated. You can subscribe for more content. And if you appreciate what we do, then yeah, you can support us on Patreon. You get access to our... What do you get access to? Our monthly live streams where you can ask questions. And yeah, that, that's a whole lot of fun. It's a long format thing that Tim and I do each month. We get together and do that when we do the Q&As. And there's also our exclusive Discord chat. So yeah, that's really cool. Anyway, I should probably wrap this up because my voice is going. It's been a, a long previous week over in Taipei, Taiwan, doing Computex. And when I got back, of course, I got sick for a few days. So my voice is still recovering and I've kind of blown it out with this video. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.